Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to uh, episode two of our Readaway series, where we're going to talk about. Actually, we're going to talk about the second chapter in uh, Ursula Le Guin's *The Dispossessed*. Uh, but first, of course, I need to introduce you all to uh, the other person on this show, and and the person whose idea this whole series was in the first place. Dana, how are you? Hey. Tired. <sighs> yeah, still doing the amusement park circuit. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Charles. Yeah, this chapter was great. I have like, my book. <laughs> I, I wrote in my book, like. You wrote in the book. Like, in, in multiple, I don't know, like along the, in underlining and along the margins and. Oh, that, I don't know if I should have showed that page. Oh, this, this, isn't, this isn't the PG-13 or the PG one. If it's PG-13, I just, uh, I used it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody read was, the page that she just showed you, okay? Page. Nobody read that page. Well, hopefully they already did, or maybe well, they already oh, did. well maybe they, uh, if if you're if you're following along, yeah. If you're oh, following this one, along. this one, this one's a good spread. See, like they write all over both pages. So <laughs> I, hope, I hope you guys have have you know brewed a pot of coffee or something because did, did do, do we have like a time limit on these things? I don't have a time limit. Okay. I'll I'll go as long as you want to go, or until right. people until people watching just get absolutely sick of it, <laughs> and they're just like we can't hear these people talk just, about no, the dispossessed I'm anymore. Tired of this. Tired of this. Yes, we all realize that capitalism sucks. Okay. Just... <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just a fun science fiction story. I didn't realize it had a message to it. Yeah, God, what is, why does Le Guin keep putting politics in our science fiction? God, I hate, I hate that so much. I hate it so much when right. I just shut up and write. <laughs> or just shut up. Or just, yeah, yeah, that, as a writer, that's what you I want mean, to that's, do. yeah. Just yeah. shut up. Just like, just like, just get a real job. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so chapter two chapter two of ursula Guin's ursula Le Guin's the dispossessed Indeed. Alrighty. so i'm just i didn't put i don't have any notes on like my first page of chapter two um my first note is diapers <laughs> oh yes <laughs> <laughs> did you know that I don't know. It's it's very minor, but uh, his diapers were about to fall off because I was like, "Really?" Yeah, yeah. I noticed that he went. He's like, he's got a little bit of a load in his pants, apparently. No, because it's his diapers. Like, how many is he wearing? Oh, his diapers. Oh, yeah. I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Because I that. Because in uh, a couple paragraphs before, um, no, no, he's not the one carrying the load. It's I think it's because he's skinny. The other baby is the one carrying the load. The, the baby yeah. who comes in and sits down, who pushes but him out of it, the sun patch. Yeah, the, the one whose diapers were about to fall off is the skinny one, which I the, the Nobby baby. The not which turns out to be Shevik. Right. Yeah. But um, here previously we have uh, that he's got a peculiar squatting gait caused by a damp and sagging diaper. And in yeah, that that's, case, that's what I was thinking of. Well, in that case, it's singular. So how come with one kid, he's wearing a diaper and the other one is his diapers? And I didn't understand that. Maybe these are, these are more of the peculiarities of the, uh, of the Anareshti language. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> It's not like she's British or something weird. <laughs> so like, he's writing in, you know, American English like we grew up with. I yeah. Mean, I don't know. Proper English. I just, what, I just no, why is it plural there? I don't know. It's a no, typo. Proper, it's, it's, just... it's, it's a typo that hasn't been caught for what, 40 or 50 years whenever this book was published? Um, uh, well, I haven't noticed some typos in the book, so it oh. might. But that that doesn't make sense either because you've got subject verb agreement there. It couldn't be his diaper. It would not have been. She wouldn't have written his diaper. Were about the fall off. Nope, because we've got. Oh, a that's right. There. Yeah, that's not it. 
So yeah, so in chapter two, we uh, we actually we don't flashback. We yeah we don't continue from where chapter one left off. We jump back all way the way back. to when Shevik is a baby. He's a little toddler. He's just a little baby, and and then we get it's basically like a series of vignettes as we kind of keep jumping. We jump forward throughout mm -hmm. his life to sort of catch up with him uh, as a baby, and then as as an eight year old, and then as a teenager. Um, I guess as a 15 year old and then as an 18 year old, right? Yeah. Is how it goes. I'll go with it. But I actually read this, uh, pretty much like the next, like the, just a few days after our last uh, live stream. So it's been a little bit. <laughs> I just, I didn't read it until yesterday. So, um, and then I, and the, but then I, and then today I went back over it to go over my notes and stuff to make sure I had something to say about it uh i mean i would have had lots to say about it anyway because i did I, it's a really good chapter but you know i just want to make sure that i'm not trying to pull stuff, stuff off the top of my head and be like oh yeah i don't i don't i remember that um but yeah so yeah we we, we start out with little baby shevik the knobby baby well also and, charles yeah. puts out uh, the first the first line is great again and one of the, uh yeah when he quoted that what i noticed is that's in the present tense and then that's right we have several lines of di of just straight dialogue it's just dialogue between um the matron and the man who we don't know who it is yet right and then the um, tense and it turns and out then, to be Shevik's father and then the tense changes Yes, and then the yep. next time that we have an action, the tense changes. So it's a great way of of sort of setting the scene almost distantly, like um, in, in in you know li what, what literature refers to as the eternal present, like when you when teacher teacher mode on here, um, when you're referring to a text in like an essay or something, right? You're supposed to use um, Brutus says to Caesar or whatever, because if you go back to that page in the text or if you watch a performance of the play it happens again. I mean, it's, it's still because it's, it's immortalized in a text, it's always happening. Right. Um, so it kind of establishes that and then pulls us back into the past by use it by switching over the past tense once we have another action, which is just really nicely done. Yeah. Sorry for getting all going all academic there, but it just, no, that's the whole point of the thing. I love it. I guess so. I guess so. Okay. Um, and then of course we have some, um, it's not really, it's not expository dialogue though, which is nice. Yeah, it's not at all, really. Where, where, um, the, the, the Nobby baby, the little scrawny baby, which we later find out of Shevik, uh, yeah. throws a pitch fit. And when, when the fat baby comes and sort of sits down next to him, kind of punts him out of the, he's sitting in a patch of sunlight. And the fat baby sits down, boom. And Shevik's like, he's yiddler. And he gets bumped out of the sunlight. And, he gets mad. He's like, he says, mine, mine, son. Mine, son. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, nothing is yours. It is to use. If you will not share it, you cannot use it. So we see some of their expectations around, you know, ownership and use and sharing, you know, and it's as it's told to babies who don't understand it. Right. You know, it's in very simplified language, which also helps the reader because this is our first introduction or, or an early introduction to it for us right. as well. Well, and also it's not just a random detail that Shevik is yes as is ambivalent about it. Yes. Um, because that comes up a couple more times in this chapter in mm -hmm. in different ways, uh, that, which that I think is really interesting. Sort of piecing and and he is that's a, a relatively common story trope, like of, of you know the the prospective character being the one who doesn't fit in. You know, so oh yeah. Outsider. You know, of the outsider. The outsider comes to town. The only story that is told is, the, is an outsider comes to town. I don't know who said that, but somebody said it, and it was it, it was me. But I was I didn't come up with it. Um, <laughs> and then and then he he she tells him this and just he just yeah. my son my and son says, and bursts into tears of rage. And we've talked about this recently because I I, I think I've talked about one of the things I love about theme parks is. <laughs> crying children because <sighs> if there's because like they pitch just like they get so tired yeah 
and like the littlest thing will set them off. But part of it is, you know, and, and having worked uh, at an amusement park and, and at attractions and things, like, it's like, it's, they will say that this is the worst thing that's ever happened. And it's just like, oh, oh, honey, it probably is. And that just, it says so much. First of all, it says you've probably had a pretty good life. If this is yeah. the worst thing that's ever happened. Yeah. So congratulations. Yay. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, you haven't had much experience yet because there's so much it could be so much worse yeah oh and it will be and it, 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 <laughs> you're it, gonna get it. your life is gonna get so much worse from this point trust me kid i hate to be yeah. the one to tell you not that it's not that your life overall is gonna get worse but you will no. have experiences you'll have worse, worse moments yeah you'll there have worse moments than this and then there will be better moments too but yeah there will be but yeah well. just the, the the little the little I can't contain all of my feels. Just, just and like, I here's what I, I here. This is this is the thought I had too about that moment. Uh, I'm a little upset on behalf of Baby Shevik because the fat baby gets off scot free. I mean, Shevik did. I mean, Shevik did the most wrong, right? Shevik was the one who threw the tantrum and who pushed the other baby and was like, you know, throwing a fit. But the other baby did push him out of the sun. Like, why that baby needs to learn how to share too, you know? And he no, just gets he, didn't. he No. Yes, he I'm, did. I'm, he did not push he, him. He sat down heavily. He crowded him out. Someone. He crowded him out. It's not it, it it not only does it not imply that it was deliberate, I would argue that it implies that it was not deliberate. It's because he's bigger and Shevik's little, it just kind right. of happens the natural cause of things. I don't think but it was Shevik, deliberate, but Shevik he still needs to learn to share. Make him share. Shevik does not try to make him share. Shevik tries to to get him out of there. Yeah. which is not an appropriate response yeah. if, if, if that must share you know then the matron would have been totally on his side but the matron takes this or is it the matron yeah. yes well, yeah the the, the matron yeah, and the father both tell him the same thing but this yeah. is a learning opportunity <laughs> and and the, the fat baby does not necessarily does not necessarily need to learn to share because it was it they didn't see any intent on his part so i don't trust that fat baby I don't trust that fat baby. I don't trust that fat baby. Well, I, I just generally don't trust babies in general. You, babies aren't to be trusted. Yeah. They're, you know. You, you, can, you can never tell what they want. Can't leave them alone for a second. Um, yeah. So, and so, and this is where we, we, we get a, we meet Shevik's father, mm -hmm. uh, referred to as the father, which we learn later in the chapter is significant that the fact that parents are referred to by, uh, the definite article instead of possessive pronouns. <laughs> uh, that's like a part of their culture. A little bit. You see it happening because uh, uh, Shevik's father says um, the mother's leaving tonight. Right. So. Um, and I didn't. And in, in, in the next section, I don't like the group director. He is a bad teacher. Oh, when when we get to uh, to eight year old Shevik. Yep. Yeah. When? Cause, yeah. Well, because because yeah, that's, that's all I had for baby Shevik. Yeah, but yeah, him. and we yeah, baby Shevik. There's not a whole lot other than you know he 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 doesn't want to share the yeah. sun patch, and then and and the we get the impression that even though even though this is a a society, a stateless society, there are there are still. I mean, it seems like the kids are for the most part don't seem to live with their parents. Because at least not not in the parts of Shevik's life that we see in this chapter, because he's at some kind of a of a center with other like babies day, here. Well, I mean, it's like a daycare. Yeah, I guess. And then and then we see him, and he's at like a school with other kids for most of the rest of uh, of the chapter, like an institute sort of. Um, but yeah, so we go we we jump ahead in the next scene break to uh, to eight year old Shevik. Because, because yeah, what 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 the matron says earlier, um, it, it implies that he's been staying with his Shevik's been staying with his parents, like living with his parents, but then during the day, this is more daycare because the matron asks, shall we take him into the nursery full time then? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's not going to be staying with his his family anymore because they're going um, somewhere else. They're they've been assigned to go some. To they've another. been assigned to go somewhere else, but but um, they're they're being split and sent different places, right. and that's why they can't take Shevik with them, or I, I, like 
He knows it's all here, but surely DivLab will send you along after Rulag soon since your partners and both engineers. Like it would make sense for them to go together. And I feel like since it's happening at the same time as he's leaving Shevik, like if he had the option to go with Rulag, I think he would, if I was thinking that he would have taken Shevik with him. Right. I don't know if he would have had, I mean, I guess he would have had that option, but it might have been very strongly frowned on. I yeah. don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, maybe because it seems like in the later in, in later scenes in the chapter, it seems like the father and Sheva have a decent relationship. I mean, right. I know, but I meant, know. I meant societally. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, like would that be, would it be an option? Right, because of the it seems like it, it might be definite article. Well, like they would definitely have the choice because it's all about free choice. But at the same time, it's not your child, just like it's not right your parent. You right. know that, that to to discourage that sort of possessive. They don't refer to things with the with possessive terms at all, unless right. well, except except for emphasis. They say later. Right. Yeah. So, right. what do you think that means about child rearing? Is extended child rearing by biological parents like discouraged i guess it would follow if it was and i mean we do like throughout the rest of the chapter as shevik grows up we don't see him living at home or living with his parents very much. i mean there's an i think there's one more scene when it when he's in you know in the company of his father and it talks mm -hmm. about his parents but for the most part he's living in a place with other kids with or, peers yeah well, yeah so maybe so maybe that maybe it does imply that that is that is not the norm you know yeah yeah but it's egoistic yeah yeah right which which is which is what eight-year-old shevik gets jumped on for being uh when he okay so he has this he has this idea that he shares with the other kids in, in his class that the the teacher that you don't like kind of jumps on him for um he talks about how he doesn't he he and later he says he's joking but he he doesn't understand he doesn't think that if you throw a rock at a tree that the rock will ever actually reach the tree because no matter where the rock is relative to the tree there will always be a point halfway between where the yeah. rock is and the tree. It's, it's a, a classic puzzle. Yeah. I'm not hurting very good right now. I'm tired. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah, so far. But, but there, there's actually, like, I should know whose puzzle it is. And I yeah. can't think of it. I don't know. Look it up, folks. <laughs> Got the internet. You're online. But yeah, it's, it's like a philosophical sort of, you yeah. know. Uh, the kind of question that there isn't supposed, it's just supposed to make you think it's the kind of thing. There isn't really like a definitive answer to it, but although, although, although Shevig, Shevig does say he, that he knows how the rock gets there, but the teacher kind of cuts well, him off. No, like, I think it's, I think it's a, like a calculus equation. Yeah. I don't know nothing about no calculus. I'm, I'm, you know. I, I was so actually, I, I can't say that with you. I was about to say I'm an English student. I don't know about that stuff, but you're an English teacher and you were the one who knew it. So I can't say that with you. Bye, <laughs> Sophia. Oh, bye, Sophia. Um, so, um, but yeah, so he gets jumped on by the teacher for, for egoizing by, by I, the teacher interrupts him repeatedly. Yes. How, like I, isn't interrupting egoistic? Because Ooh. my thoughts are more important than yours. You need to stop talking. Hi, Liam. But could you also could you could you counter argue to that that it is the teacher's appropriate role to sort of have some authority over the students? And if the teacher Not judges in this society, are you kidding? Well, but, but okay, but functionally, that's clearly what's happening. I mean, and, and if the teacher judges that one student is overstepping their, their bounds by talking too much, isn't it appropriate for the teacher as the teacher, as the leader of the group, as the facilitator of the education, whatever, whatever, whatever anarchists call it. So they feel better about it. The teacher is in charge. 
<laughs> right. And the oh. teacher and the teacher has to make sure that the other kids are being served. And if 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 the teacher thinks that Shevik is talking too much, I mean, isn't it appropriate for the teacher to step in and say, "Shut up." <laughs> and again, it's it's not the use of the, the the more appropriate the more appropriate response in the society because the teacher does not have authority. I'll be really clear on that. That the, 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 this teacher should not have authority. No. Okay. I don't. I'm that, I, I, okay. Yes, but authority. No, th there's not supposed to be, you know, hierarchy in the society. Like, and and that's you know coming in with an external understanding that that this is a a, a non hierarchical society. So no, the teacher does not have authority, and in that response, the teacher should let Shevet come to a point. Let, just just wait, just wait. Either wait for one of the other students to interrupt or to wait for Shevik to sort of become uncomfortable with how much he's talking and to see how long that that would take. And then point out, Shevik, you just, or maybe, maybe, maybe keeping track of it some way discreetly so that it's not, you know, obvious. <laughs> just, just in a sense of saying, Shevik, you just talked for, you know, over three minutes by yourself and nobody else, you didn't let anybody else say anything. And then you asked a question which you said that, you know, didn't really need an answer, which means you didn't want to listen to anybody. Right. And that was what the teacher was objecting to. Yeah. Yes. But did so by interrupting. Because who has time? We don't have all day. Yeah, they do. <laughs> to learn something important. Yes, you do. I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm on Shevik's side because Shevik is, you know, Shevik, as we talked about already, like Shevik is out of step with sort of the rest of society, kind of like he's he sees things a little differently. And, and um, I'm sort of, I'm you know, sympathetic to that. Uh, but I have no problem with a teacher, you know, cutting off a kid who's talking too much. I mean, for, for the sake of the class or the, or like, that just sounds like hell on earth to me. I'm supposed to just let the kid talk himself out. There, there were, that's literally what the class is about. It's literally what the class is about. Speaking this is why, this is why I could, I, I don't think I could ever be an anarchist. Like I'd be like, no, okay, that's nice. Please just every, you're talking way too much kid. Well, then, you know, you would, you would, you would have the option not to choose to be a teacher. Okay, cool. I also, but I, I also, I just want to, I mean, functionally, also, even though, even though you say there's no hierarchy and there's no authority functionally, as we see in the scene, the teacher is in charge of this class. Like, because the students allow it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, 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 and, and, and so here we see some of the challenges of, you know, anarchy. Right. Um, now, and I have another point that I want to get to at the scene and don't, okay. It's all yours. I'll get to it. I know, but I just might forget it. So, sorry, two points, and now I forgot the other one. The one I was going to before I reminded you that I have another one that I'm going to I'm going to freaking forget them both. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you have them written down in the book? Didn't you make notes? No, they're based on what you said. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, then, then they can't be that important. There's so much that's wrong with that. We need to stop. <laughs> so. This shows this shows some of the challenges with an an, an uh, uh, non hierarchical society is that someone can take authority and if everybody else just lets them go just goes along with it well then they like you said they functionally have it and it's not because it's what the society values it's it's part of the you know the different nature of different individuals and the fact that. I, I would say that this is showing some failure on the part of the society to live up to the ideals of its founders mm -hmm. because these children have, because the other kids don't call out the instructor for interrupting. Right. About and, and being egoistic. Um, and yeah. Oh, okay. And the, then the second part. So, so, so we're seeing some of the challenges with maintaining a non-hierarchical uh, society is that you have to reinforce that and you have to, and they are trying to do so 
But at the same time, I think there is some sort of nature. It is, there is a nature in all of us to be egoistic, to, 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 you know, to be impatient, you know, to just like, just stop child. (laughs) And it takes training and diligence and, and practice to set that aside and to do what the child needs, what the children need. And And, and yeah, yeah, Charles, like, like, like you're saying there, uh, I'm trying to figure out where's the stance. What, what section are you on? I'm looking here. Was that in the early part? Uh, no threat of physical violence. The that was when they had, that was when the, the fight a little bit later, right? Okay. Yeah. So, so, so again, there's, you can assert authority and, but it's up to others to accept or reject it. Like you don't have any institutionalized authority. And that's what I'm saying. The teacher does not just as in, in the role of teacher, you don't necessarily have that role of there, there's no inherent authority in the role or there should not be if, you know, according to the, the, you know, the ideals theoretically of the society. And I think I think we're supposed to, we're supposed to see this teacher as that we're supposed to see this as a failing on the teacher's part. We are not supposed to, we're supposed to sort of understand because, you know, we live in a society where the teacher does have the authority to say, sit down, close your mouth, you are talking out of turn. Right. You know, it's very common. Um, But that's not what the society purports to value. And this is literally a speaking and listening workshop. And so the teacher yeah. should be demonstrating good speaking and listening behaviors. And he's Pro- not. Probably also worth mentioning that the teacher is described as being relatively young. I think the teacher is described as being in his 20s. Uh, so maybe the, you know the, that's part of, you know, that's meant to be part of the text it's not just you know an accident yeah. or an oversight on Le Guin's part the the, the teacher is a young ish person perhaps it, perhaps maybe inexperienced in this role or, or, yeah. or you know so or any role really yeah so the fact that he would not realize that his Did own I? his own behavior was egoizing Ego- in a different way that you know that yeah. that's that makes sense in a way um yeah yeah Oh, yep. Yeah, we're, we're slightly, it's actually on the next page for me. Um, and I have assertion of authority circled, Charles. Uh, very much <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, and this is also, uh, it's after this incident that we hear about Shevik becoming <laughs> interested in, in mathematics. Yeah, and this, I really think that Le Guin is emphasizing the, the the director is being used as the non-example like right. an, anti, an anti-example because you know um you know no threat of physical violence assertion of authority a little weakened by his his irritable response and then he he says it again no and stop egoizing then he resumed his melodious pedantic tone this kind of thing is really directly contrary to what we're after in the speaking and listening group speech is a two-way function And he's not listening to Shevik. Right. Like he's literally doing the thing that he's preaching against. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then. Yeah. And he starts getting interested in math more. Right. Because math, because numbers make sense to him. He says words don't always even out. That's I, I, but I, I numbers make sense. Well, yeah. But I, I, what I what I noted on this, it says his knowledge of this shows the weakness of his knowledge in, in math. Um, yeah, it shows a knowledge of um, basic math, like numbers. Um, he is much more aware of the limits on numbers. And, you know, he's aware that you can do more with words. He's not aware of all of the things that you can do with numbers 
that go beyond two plus the the the, the very rigid sort of boundaries of arithmetic and mm -hmm. you know halves and doubling and things like that so he's playing with what those limits are but he doesn't really understand them yet and yet he's already discovered that words have limits and you can play with those words and arrange them in different ways yeah. to get around those limits and he hasn't quite discovered that with numbers which is interesting because what he likes about numbers is like inaccurate it shows that he doesn't understand them as well as he thinks he does. It's just, it just, right. It's, it shows he's, a, he's still a little naive. Um, he is. Th there's, like, yeah. What, the, what he dislikes about words is also true of numbers. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't realize that yet. And it right. shows that he knows words better than he knows numbers. So I don't yeah. know. I there's a really, there's a really nice line. There are a couple of, there, there are several really, really nice lines uh, in this chapter. And one of the ones that I, that I uh, wrote down to mention is from that scene and it's it just it really speaks to his to his naivete which is if a, he says if a book were written all in numbers it would be true it would be just which is which is almost dogmatic you know it's I'm like in, this I'm absolute belief what i underlined yeah. was if you saw the numbers you could see that the balance the pattern yeah and that's something that i've i've talked about with uh my english classes and with some of the math teachers is that the, no, that's just as true with words as it is with numbers. I mean, yeah. it's true in the same way. It's all about abstract thinking and finding a way to represent abstract ideas right. and looking for patterns and looking for how patterns interact and how we show how we work with these patterns and how we go beyond these patterns and how far can you push a pattern before you know you're being inconsistent and it doesn't work anymore. Like how far can you push a story before it's not a story? Um, how can how far can you push a poem before it's just like it doesn't make any sense you know those <laughs> kinds of things and you do the same thing like when you get into higher math you do yeah. the same thing like you explore the limits like literally limits limits are a thing in math like literally limits and 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 functions and so like it's just a different mode of expression yeah well yeah well be it's one of the things that's what you realize, and again, I'm not, I, I have a very, very, very limited understanding of math in general, and, 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 and especially like higher levels, more complex levels of math. But I mean, yeah, one of the things that Shevik doesn't quite realize at that point is not only is math not really like that, but if it were like that, it would not be as useful as he thinks it is. Like if it were that simple and black and white, we couldn't use it to describe the things in the universe that we use it to describe, that we, that we rely on it to describe. Because the whole point of math isn't to simplify things, it's to allow us to describe things as accurately as we can figure out in all of their complexity. And sometimes that, that yields answers that don't We're really make for. sense. Yeah. 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 And I think Charles's point, you know, that that um, the way that authority tends to disregard the rule of law or, or, or convention or, you know, it takes it, it egoizes inherently. That's that's kind of what authority is. Um, a willingness to egoize to say, I know. Yeah. To, to yeah. take charge, to assert. Yeah. To say, uh, some, yeah, somebody needs to decide what we do next and that somebody should be me and here's what we should do. Yeah. Um, do you have more for the eight-year-old stuff or do, we, do you want to jump ahead to 12-year-old Shevik? Because this, the 12-year-old Shevik was a really interesting I don't have anything else written down for eight-year-old Shevik. The prisons, yeah. The yeah, yeah. I mean, oh so the I, I'm sure a lot of other people reading the chapter had the same thought as I did, uh, because it's a really famous like psychological experiment. But like the very first thing that I thought of was the Stanford Prison Experiment. I thought have these. You read, have you read about the the, the follow up studies? I don't know if I have. Oh my gosh! Yes. But yeah, the uh, that that's what the these you know Shevik and his his peers, his friends, these kids, <laughs> basically. They get well. They learn about uh, Odo, who is sort of the founder of their philosophy, the the founder of their society, um, and they learn about how before the current 
society there there was a state and there were prisons and odo was a, was a prisoner and the kids get interested in this and they're like what is like what does that mean what's a prison and they start exploring this concept and because they've never experienced anything like this before because there's no state compulsion in their society uh like the concept of a prisoner just doesn't make sense in their in their worldview in their frame of reference well, they, also they, there's no compulsion in general right yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and yeah, yeah there, there's no state like at all. Um, and Although, yeah, there. I mean, if, if they, if he could, if, I mean, Shevik essentially, if he could remember back, could remember being, you know, you can't, you, you being prevented from going after the fat baby. Yeah, right. <laughs> like literally being prevented. I mean, that's, that's the closest. And, and he may not remember that at this point. Right. Um, one thing that I did circle from early on was the, the notion of a circuit history teacher. Which I noticed that, that too. Right. You know, like, you know, that the, they have, you know, and, and so they probably off, don't often get these lessons. Um, right. The history teacher rode into town. Yeah, and also I, I didn't I didn't mark it, but um, I remember just sort of. So they're curious. I don't know. I guess it just depends on the person. They're curious about prisons. Yeah. And the phrasing that Laguin uses is interesting. Uh, he the, the teacher explains the subject quote with the reluctance of a decent adult forced to explain an obscenity to children. I'm just like, I don't know what that... <sighs> well, I guess because it isn't it sort of like, especially in a society like this, where uh, they they frown on hierarchy and compulsion and, and, and stuff like that. Like, isn't it sort of like the kids asking for forbidden knowledge? Like, you don't really want to explain the concept to them because they're just kids and maybe they don't, they haven't yet come to understand why the way that their society is, is, is arranged now is, is more beneficial. So what if, I mean, what if they, they learn about the concept of prison and they're like, huh, actually that sounds kind of great. <laughs> you know, like, why can't we do that? Like, why can't we put people in prison if they're giving everybody no, else a hard that's time? Not, that's not the um, way the conversation goes. We have these conversations. You don't have these conversations. But I guarantee you, women have these conversations with their daughters. Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like, but, but in, in a, in a, in a society where prisons like don't exist, maybe it's like the teacher kind of feels like, why should I? Why should I, if, if this is something they're never going to encounter in their lives, presumably, unless there's like a radical change in society. It's a history teacher. Yeah, I get, yeah, I mean, I see your point, but I, I mean, if, 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 why, why it's described as, why his attitude is described in that way, why as he would reluctant. be reluctant, yeah, it's like, because. Like, like, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm not real keen on that word. Um. Charles, that's a great question because I, I really wasn't, I really wasn't sure about it because. Yeah. Charles is asking if, if we think most disciplines would have traveling instructors. Oh yeah. 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 Well, I mean, the, like if somebody's watching this later, that'll still be in the chat, right? Yeah. Uh, eventually. Okay. So, um. So just cool your jets, people watching later. If the live chat isn't replaying, it will be eventually. Oh, well, I hope it is. It will so, be. Yeah. It will um, be. I think, I think, uh, so Charles. I'm getting a little bit ahead of it here, but so you can do whatever job you want. So I don't really know how it would work if lots of people wanted to be a history teacher and like nobody wanted to listen to them. Um, it more makes it sound like not very many people want to be history teachers. Or, or maybe even want to be teachers. But another possibility is um, that uh, th this is, they don't have a lot. Like it's not, they don't live in a, a, a an area a geographically that is abundant in resources. Right. So they That's have to what struggle I just to, okay, good. I'm, 
I'm not getting too far ahead because I remember that from before. So they there's a lot of struggle for just to, to maintain um, enough food and, you know, clean water and things like that that they need for, you know, survival and basic necessities. So they don't have a lot of stuff. Um, so education, while it's important, does not fulfill a, you know, a, a biological necessity. It's not an imperative. And so those may be more, I don't know, privileged positions. They, they may be, you may be sort of nudged. You, you wouldn't be forced, but you may be nudged into more necessary um, careers. You know, things that are more engineering type stuff for, mm. for maintaining their society. So I don't, I don't know that it's just not popular. I think it's more out of, we need to make sure that we can have food. <laughs> And stuff like that <laughs> right because you know they don't have animals and like you know they have like a whole place you know i think we saw that in this chapter like that used to be a fertile area and they're trying to right. reinvigorate it and you know so that's where some of the engineering comes in um and that comes in again later the the, the idea of the teacher being reluctant uh he spoke and i've, I've got it marked uh, in this case, I've got it marked here. He spoke with the violence of one forced to say the detestable and embarrassed by it. And I marked embarrassed by it. And I wanted to know why he was embarrassed by the existence of this, because it's not their society. Like, it, what it makes me think of is uh, mainstream American attitude towards um, our, our, our history with race. And yes. just like, oh, you know, after the civil rights era, you know, racism was over. And, you know, wasn't a racism bad and slavery right. was bad. And, and now we don't have to bad. talk about it. Now we don't have to worry about it anymore. And those right. people were bad people. And now we're so much better. You know, there's this this smug sort of condescension in how we look at those people versus, you know, how the way we do things is so much better. And you definitely don't get that from this guy. <laughs> um, but the fact that he's embarrassed by it was definitely interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they, they, they do their version of the Stanford prison experiment where they, they build like a prison cell for themselves. Um, and one of their group, uh, Kadagv, or however you pronounce his name, uh, ba volunteers. He's like, I'll be the prisoner. And they well, end yeah, up it, earlier. They, they say, so who's going to stay in that box long enough to run out of air chorus of volunteers and claimants. They all want to stay in until they can't breathe. Yeah. Cause they think it's fun. It's like a game. And then Tyrion's like, you're all nuts. <laughs> you're all, <laughs> I did like with, all just, you're all crazy. It's what he says. <laughs> I did like the detail where they want I think, was it Shevik who pointed out that they should, they should drill like an air hole in the door. And, and one of the other ones was like, that'll take forever. <laughs> but he's like, well, we need to, I mean, <laughs> whoever we put in there needs to be able to breathe. Right. <laughs> like that's almost like an afterthought to them. Um, but they end up first, they put him in, they put him into the, into the prison for a couple of hours, I think. And then they let him out and he says, Oh, I could do way longer than that. So they end up putting him in for like a day and a half. And when, when they, uh, and when, and when they let him out, like he's filthy, he's, you know, defecated on himself. Uh, he's, and, and Shevik is really, really disturbed by this. Shevik is, is sort of shown as of all the kids in the group, he's the one who has the most ambivalence toward this and doesn't really get, why it's a fun thing to do and doesn't really like it and and is actually so upset by it that after after they take their friend out of the out of the prison and they clean him up and make sure he's okay that Shevik actually goes off somewhere by himself and vomits he's like so upset, upset. by it yeah yeah um charles the the line that you have i underlined and the question that i said is at what point does this change and why um, Richard, we're talking about chapter two of The Dispossessed. So we're right at where they're 12 years old and they have just um, made a prison to find right. out, you know, what the, what the heck is this? So they're, they're curious. Um, Le Guin said um, the simple lore of perversity. I'm like, girl, they're just curious. 
Okay, you know, it, it's I, I don't necessarily think it's perversity. It's it's a lack of understanding and curiosity. And Shevik is very curious. Well, and, perversity and, from the perspective of their society, though. I mean, this yeah. would be like an incredibly abnormal thing to them. You know. Abnormally, yes, but I, I don't think it would be abnormal to them. They're not yet that far into understanding their own society. They, it, they well, just don't understand it. Like it's. But not, they're still it, puzzled by the idea. They're still puzzled by the concept. And yes, in a way that yes. I think, in a way that I think most twelve-year-olds from our society wouldn't be. You know what I mean? Like I feel yeah. like if you explain the concept of prison to a child in our society, they would they would have enough of a frame of reference of how things generally work that they wouldn't have that big, they, you know, they might have like objections to it, but they would understand what it was. And I think these yeah. kids, because they live in a society that just, this is completely alien to them. Um, I think that's what makes it perverse in that sense. It makes it, it's, 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 uh, it's I, such I, I a deviation from the norm. Okay. Um, okay. Because, because perversity in, implies a sense of wrongness. And I don't get that from, I don't get that vibe from them. Like they're like, it, like you said, use the word alien and unfamiliarity. I think that's more along the lines of what the vibe that I'm getting from the from the children. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Fair um, enough. And then I like the description later on. Um, a couple of things. Um, their group met the foreman asked where Karag was and they don't say anything and Chevik feels you know feels good about letting it ride right. but then later or, or at the same time Tyrion just lies and that yes. shocks Chevik so and that's it's interesting because you know there's there's deceit in both cases but the outright lie is is he has a much stronger a much different reaction to and i thought that was interesting yeah and then the description later just very later when when he's not feeling good about this uh it describes as it's a feeling he'd never had before something like embarrassment but worse than that inward and vile and i just yeah. i liked that description so what did what what would you say that he's feeling well, I, what I found interesting about it was how it connects to uh, how it sort of it adds some some dimension to how we see him react in chapter one when he realizes he's locked in the room, you know, on on the ship, like the idea of being imprisoned, of of being confined involuntarily is 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 absolutely deeply offensive yeah, to him. Yeah, but it's not the same because the, the, it, it's, he has an external reaction there and here is some, something like embarrassment but worse worse than that i think she's being very specific in what she's what she's expressing there or in oh. what he's feeling okay okay i think he's feeling guilty <laughs> and he's never felt that before he's never felt guilt interesting yeah i didn't I, I never i didn't think about that but yeah but she doesn't she doesn't just tell us that it was yeah. the first time he had felt guilt it's rather she describes it in a way that shows that he's not familiar with it. Right. And she also does tell us that he's never felt this before, but she doesn't tell us what it is. Right. Yeah, that's I true. Yeah, she doesn't name it. Choice. Yeah. Yeah. I know the other thing is we don't know that Chevik's the only one who feels this way, that, that Chevik's the only one who is this disturbed. That's he true. He off by himself to throw up. Right. And we're not following any of the other characters. So, right. Yeah. For all we know, they're all running out to barf. I don't think so, though. But Why maybe. Not? But maybe. Oh, I, well, I mean, they just don't. I, it seems, well, for one thing, we're, we're, we're being shown that, that Shevik is out of step. So that would be consistent if he was the only one who had that much of a problem with it. And it just and seems like previously. Yes. Yeah. But and it seems like the rest of them are just, they're just having a good time. They're just having fun exploring this, you know, like they think it's kind of a lark and Shevik, especially by the end of it, clearly doesn't think that. What does he say or do 
that shows that. That shows that, that he doesn't like it? Mm-hmm. Well, other than throwing up when it was over. Um, no, because earlier it's, you know, when, when Gibesh is, is laughing about, you know, about what if he has to crap and they all start, they all start laughing. Yeah. All of them, which means it includes Shevik. And then later, um, Shevik doesn't say anything and Tyrion lies. And it tells us that Shevik is shocked and uncomfortable. His legs itched, his ears felt hot. But he doesn't yeah. say anything. So to Tyrion, it's just like, Shepard's just like a stone, a stone wall. He's a stone cold badass. <laughs> and, you know, maybe Tyrion feels just as bad. And he thinks that Shevik, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's entirely possible that Shevik is not the only one feeling this way. It's possible. But, well, there, there's also the bit uh, later on and uh, near the end of that scene um before they Jalen, let him out maybe right that's that's a, that's a great word shame versus guilt yeah yeah but there's there's a scene near the end of that scene or a, a moment near the end of that scene when uh again it's with it's with gebish who has been on guard duty and he mentions he thought he heard cad talking funny in the cell and and shevik is the one who suggests letting him out and uh and then Tyrion says no come yeah. on i think he says don't get altruistic and, and then Shevik responds by saying, I'm not being altruistic. I just want to be able to respect myself. So he's indicating that he's having problems with this even before, mm -hmm. even, even before he runs off to throw up, you know, and, and the other, the other boys, as, at least again, I mean, as far as we see, maybe they're keeping it into themselves too, like you said, but as far as we see through their interactions, then the others seem to be pushing back against Shevik, you know, saying, oh, come on, you know. Yeah, but when they see Kadag, the, it, 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 the, the, he, he, you know, he's made a mess on himself, yeah. you know, or in the cell, at least. Well, I own yeah. himself a little bit too. And, and he's gotten clothes, on yeah. him. Yeah. And he, he tries to hide it when he sees, and nobody makes fun of him. Nobody right. calls him out. And so they're, they're all, everything is quieted down. Yeah. Nobody said anything much. No, they, they, they definitely seem to feel empathy for him when they realize yeah. what, a, what, what, a, what a hardship it's been. Yeah. So, and none of them. Only Gibesh also, you know, boasted about it, it says. So Yeah. But nobody else nobody else goes back there. None of the five boys ever went back to the prison. Right. And Gibbish boasts about it like long after the fact. Mm -hmm. Not you know, not yeah. to CAD. Right. Right. Hmm. And then we get to what are they? Yeah, fifteen, sixteen. They're fifteen, ish. yeah, yeah. And they have this, this is, we get a little bit of, uh, uh, we f filling in a little bit about what the situation is with, uh, Anaresh and, and Urus. Yeah. Um, because they're talking about the history and talking about how, you know, like our moon is their earth and our earth is their moon and sort of, uh, how it's reversed, how yeah. it's reversed and, and how, and, and how they don't really know anything about the other planet because there's so little contact. They only, they, you know, their, their information, their films, I guess, about life on Urus are 150 years old or the yeah. pictures they have are hundred. So they have this idea of what life is like, what society is like on that planet. But as far as they know, it might be totally different now because their information is so old. And the only, the only things they know are what people who actually work at the port can tell them Right. Because they're the only ones that actually interact with people from the other planet. Yeah. And then girls. I, I like a little bit of it. Yes. <laughs> Just the, the, the closing. It, you know, they, they tried they tried figuring, you know, what's going on with the girls. We don't understand that it, it, nothing mattered. The girls were just, they were just there. Girls were everywhere. <laughs> God, you, just, you, you can't, this, nothing helps. Nothing helps. <laughs> oh... 
that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, it was interesting. Um, they use some. It says uh, when they're they're talking about the the films. Uh -huh. Um. The, the the propertied class that yotic words were used as there were no equivalent for either word in pravic Propertied, i can believe but class simply means category they got categories right. so i disagree that there should that the word you know they, they should not be able to translate that or group So well, maybe like, it may be because like the, they, they have other words for it, but maybe because the term class can also be employed in that way. Maybe they just don't have that word. You know, they would say they, they would say their equivalent of, of group. a different language. Well, but I mean, but the, you know, the equivalent of that word, like they would, they have words. I'm, clearly they have words for group or category or whatever, but they just don't have an equivalent of class, you know? I think that's kind of what what, what they More were getting at. Of the, the the meaning of the word. I don't know. Yeah, that works. <laughs> oh, and it's it's interesting too because like I mean the book is written in English but refers yeah. to words refers to they, words they, in other they, languages. They speak English. Yeah. They ain't from England. No. English. <laughs> What's <laughs> that? Yeah, we're going to England. <laughs> Uh, and this is also, I noticed, I noted in this section is, um, when they're talking about, uh, an Irish versus Urus and, and being curious about it. And, and someone brings up the idea of, of visiting there or of leaving an Irish to go to Urus and it's Shevik who yeah. pushes against that and says, why would anybody want to go there why would you want to leave here and he even says you don't we don't leave an Irish because we are an Irish yeah. and, and and you can't to leave here would be like saying you were going to leave yourself he I think he, he uses Tyran as an example he says you can't Tyran you can't leave Tyran you are Tyran well yeah but that's because Tyran's the one who who's who's um questioning it you know he says right. why haven't their proprietarian societies collapsed if they're so bad, why are they still, you know, what makes right. them think that they're still there? You know, right. well, obviously they know they're still there, but you know, how are they able to continue to function if they're so bad? If they're bad? so bad, yeah. And then uh, also he says, you can prove anything using the analogy and you know it. It sounds like that's a proverb and I wondered who he was quoting. I don't know. I just literally, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um. And he also, this is also where he, it could, because like he, I, I find it really interesting how they're, how conflicted Shevik is. Um, because on the one hand, he, he makes that counter argument to Tyran about going to Urus and how, you know, why we are of this place, like this society is who we are. Um, but at the same time, or, you know, not at the same time, but right after that, he tells the story about the time he saw a burn victim die yeah. and and how that experience convinced him that you actually can't really ever help anybody which yeah. which undermines one of the fundamental principles of their society like if if you cannot help anybody really then on what basis is mutual aid you know like so he so he he seems to be getting at this this ambivalent, even though he he clearly has internalized a lot of the principles of his society and and believes in it, he is also still sort of detecting what he perceives as as flaws or inconsistencies. Yeah. And and <laughs> when and when he says that, it's the rest of his friends who are like, "What are you talking about?" Who don't get what he's saying when he says you can't really help anybody, because yeah. then they're like, "Well, what's the point then? Like, if if that's true, then what are we even doing? What are you saying?" And he doesn't really have an answer. Yeah, he's just thinking about things. Yeah. It's kind of his thing. Good morning, yeah. Daryl Trekkie. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Uh, did it, is it here in there? Yeah. Um, it was interesting, his phrasing. 
they gave us their moon, didn't they? He's talking about uh, the Erasti. Right. And I, so I, I marked that. And of course, he's using the possessives there. That's right. Yes, he is. And but it, at the same time, the Odonians were members of that society at the time. So wasn't it just as much in their moon as any as much as anybody else's? That's true. Yeah, it wasn't. You know? Yeah. Um, well, and it's interesting that they wouldn't think of it that way, given that the, the, the moon somehow the, belongs to this other society. Yeah. But, you know, despite the fact that they're the ones living there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think Tyrion, to some degree, is just being kind of like Shevik is, is being sort of pilpal, you know, um, deliberately argumentative, just, just for the sake of playing with ideas. Sure. Yeah. So at the same time, then the, the whole um, hate's not functional. The phrasing on that, it just, again, feels very proverbial to me. Like they, they, they're taught that, you know, that, that, that hate has no function. Oh, I agree. It definitely sounds like, like when, when he says that, it sounds like he's repeating something that he's been taught. That he's heard. Yeah. 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 So. yeah for real. Um, because, be, because that, that is, as you mentioned earlier, when you were talking about, uh, you know, like the fact that may, maybe the reason why there aren't that many history teachers is because they're, they're sort of encouraged uh, yeah. to do more they essential jobs like that, yeah. that, that is also a very important principle in their society that, if we're going to survive, if we're going, if people in our society are going to be okay, then we need to, we need to. If our society is going to continue. Yeah. We need to do what is best for the whole, not just what is best for us as individuals. Yeah. And functionality is a very, very valued part. thing. Yeah. Um, I also noted that the horse. <laughs> that it's don't a, you, you know, a call back. Yeah. Don't you want to go to Earth and see a horse? And you know, he, he asks in the first chapter, was that a horse? No, that was not a horse. Yeah. But it was yeah. like a horse. It was of. close. 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 But no cigar, Shevik. No cigars for you. <laughs> What's a cigar? That's not functional. <laughs> it's 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 so not functional. You just light well, it on fire? Ah. Uh, <laughs> I think I think those who are our age and older <laughs> will know the function of a cigar. There's other functions of the a cigar. Yeah. Functions. There are sometimes it's, it's just sometimes it's just a cigar. It is multi-purpose, uh, potentially. Uh, um, also, again, uh, for learned phrases, um, I'm a non-organic word. Yes. I'm like. That's a non-organic word. Yeah. Oh, and then I also, ex you're, external, you're externalizing the integrative function itself. Yeah, that rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> He's egoizing. He's <laughs> um, And it was interesting. Uh, and then he continued... He continues egoizing. I feel like he's, he's preaching to the choir here. He's speaking to hear himself speak. Mm -hmm. um, are we kept here by force? What, for, what force? What laws, governments, police, none. Simply our own being. No, Shevik. Oh, bless your heart. He does. I think she captures the voice well because he does sound like he's 15 or 16. He sounds like my friggin' students. Yeah. You know, when, when they... He sounds like the ones who know... Who, who, have been told for some time that they're smart and are confident and yet self-conscious of their of, of, of their intelligence and so they feel the need to prove it consistently oh very that, much you know, i agree that, that it... he has to do this because he has to prove that he is this thing that he's been told that he is um simply our own being our nature as it means um, <laughs> and this is what you were talking about earlier. It's your nature to be Tyrion and my nature to be Shevik and our common nature to be Odonians. Responsible to one another. And that was interesting because he's talking about their responsibilities to each other. But they were previously talking about any responsibilities that they had to the Arasti. Right. And they don't, he's, he's implying that they don't have a responsibility to the Arasti, not to outsiders. Right. We right. are responsible to each other, but not 
not we, beyond. They, not to them. Yeah. They are they are not us, and we don't have a responsibility to them. Which probably so. goes along with that idea of you know you're be, because in order for their society to function, like they they kind of need to prioritize their own society. Yeah. You know they obviously uh, have limited that, resources. That, uh, the the functionality. Yeah. Like we were talking about. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Oh, and then and then uh, Turin's like, can't get. Can I get a word in edgewise, dude? Um, <laughs> and then he says, you don't say anything till you've saved up a whole truckload of of heavy brick arguments. And it, with the note I put in there is, he's using an analogy. What a hypocrite! <laughs> you can prove anything with an analogy. Yeah. I did like, I, but and, and it's a really good analogy, though. I, I really like that line when he when he says you don't even you don't say anything until you've saved up. You know, like I, I love that line because because you could he's like yeah you kind of do you, you just because it, it creates the impression that this is something that happens a lot that that Shevik is that guy in their friend group yeah. who's always kind of going off on a love, tangent, love, pontificating. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's right. And and suddenly Steve says, sixteen year olds are gonna sixteen year old. They are they're sixteen year olding in this. It's, yes, it's very big well time. done. It's, big it's, time. She has she has spent some time listening to fifteen and sixteen year olds because yeah, it's, 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 it's God it's good. They're so full of themselves. Yeah. I love you it, all. It, but you really are. It you reminds really me are. so cute. It reminds me of, of, of like of conversations that my friends and I had with each other when we were teenagers, because it is it's that like you don't realize how full of yourself you sound and you don't realize how They're much so it's like baby Shevik. Yeah. He just he just he's full of his feels and he just can't let them out except by bawling. Yeah, he's just all he's got. He's just a ball of feels. <laughs> and you don't realize how much you don't know. Like you you're able you're smart enough and able to articulate things in a way that sounds intelligent or, or approximates mm -hmm. intelligence, but you don't realize how much well, you it's, don't it's know. It's not intelligent. It's yeah. It's, it's intelligence with a lack of experience yeah. and a lack of knowledge. It's, it's shallow just intelligence. Yeah. It's shallow and you don't realize how shallow it is because you're 16. <laughs> oh. you know? Which is, is, has always interested me. Like if we could live for like 200 years, you know, what would you know now that we're in our forties? Right. Would we would 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 our elders think of us the way we think of sixteen year olds? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like I mean, you don't know. You haven't seen nothing so. yet. <laughs> Tolkien seems to think so. Um, and then I I underlined the end of the section a beautiful example of the improbability of the real. Yes, it's another really nice line. Really nice mm -hmm. line. She has a lot of those, but she weaves them in so smoothly. It's not just yeah. like, this is pretty. I'm going to include it. It's just <laughs> blows. And they're also tricky. That's kind of what I was thinking, you know, from the point of view with someone of, of someone with more experience. Gosh, even from the point of view of like, you know, if we still have uh, parents or grandparents that are significantly older, they're going to be looking at us and like, oh, you little, you little middle-aged folks. Just change it. Until you get <laughs> on you. And then, gosh, a little bit later, I have a part underlined, and I marked it as so 18. <laughs> Wasn't it immoral to do work that you didn't enjoy? Yes, yes, yes. God. Oh, kid. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, oh, you sweet summer child. You sweet summer child. <laughs> oh. And then, and then, um... You know, again, he was not working. He was being worked. It's so unfair. Yeah. Very, uh, and yeah, then he's... my note is, can't he refuse? <laughs> Choice and consequence. He has, he has the option to refuse. And yet. Yet. Yeah. And then, you know, yet it was queer how proud you felt of what you got done this way. All together, what satisfaction it gave you. So... He's, he's again, you know, that, that ambivalence, yeah. that, that push pull. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, is sort of becomes the defining, 
his, one of his defining traits. Mm-hmm. You know, like he 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 obviously believes in these principles and in the society, but he can't help but notice the inconsistencies or or the questions that maybe aren't answered to his satisfaction. You know. Um, they're all through Trekkie. I think a uh, random geek would like it. And then Shevik and Se- Shevik. Yes, right. There, yeah. They, it, this, well, yeah. In the section when they're eighteen, there's there's someone else in their group who is named Shevet, who, who who tell who tells Shevik at one point, you need to start calling yourself something else. And Shevik is like, oh, no, I don't think so. Um, we also see that they they use profiteer as an insult. We we also we we, are, we earlier heard them say proprietarian. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's what they use as, as sort of a way to, to try to dig at each other, get under each other's skin, call each other profiteer. And Shevik is like, don't you call me a profiteer. <laughs> and I also thought it was interesting in this section that they have a fight and the mm-hmm. other, the other people don't intervene as long as they perceive that it's a fair fight. Like nobody steps in to break it up. They let them fight as long as it's a fair fight. Yeah, saw that it was a fair fight, but not an interesting one. They just, I was like, oh, what's <laughs> that? It's fair, but not interesting. Okay. Just, Let them fight. Just, y'all take care of it. Um, and then later on, uh, she refers to it as a gift. And I'm like, I don't understand that. <laughs> no, he's 18 at this point, punk rock zoologist. So um, so, so Steve, um, have you ever been in a fight? Uh, no, not really. I've been punched, but I've never been in like, like a full on, like, you know, you fists punch- flying, like proper fight. No, you've been punched. So you didn't punch back. No, I didn't punch back. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. It was the way, because it, it, it was like, I think it was, I think I was in seventh grade and it was like a sucker punch. Like somebody, like he, I was having an argument with somebody and I turned away from him for a second and I turned back and he popped me right in the nose. So I was like, it was like a shock. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, what the, what was that? You know? And my instinct wasn't like, and I was like, there were, there were, and there were a bunch of us around, like there were friends around and like just the like the the vibe wasn't like fight 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 the vibe was like what the hell was that you know because it was oh so yeah the vibe wasn't... yeah and it was weird so what, like what... i don't remember i like i wasn't angry like i was i was just like shocked you know like i didn't really feel like i didn't feel like an impulse to hit him back you know huh. interesting yeah and honestly, I, now looking back, now I kind of admire him for it because that's what you want to do. You want to hit the other guy first, you know, and take him out so you don't have to, you know, you know what I mean? Like he did the, like, in, in, I mean, there was a fight technically and he won it with one punch because he hit me and I didn't hit him back. Hmm. So there you go. That's what you need to do. But did you concede to him because he hit you? I mean, for all intents and purposes, I did. You'd already turned did, away, though. Well, but well, but, well, yeah, that was before the punch, though. I mean, I think I only turned away momentarily. I think maybe like I turned away, like to say something to one of my other friends, and then turned back to him, like expecting whatever we were talking about to continue, and then he popped me in the nose. Um, yeah, I, I disagree. I don't. I don't necessarily think that means you conceded. It would it would depend on how you responded after that, but I guess I don't know. But anyway, it's the you know strike first, strike hard, no mercy. I mean, he showed mercy in the sense that he didn't keep hitting me; he only hit me once. But you know, he struck first and he struck hard, and that was the end of the fight. I mean, it was a sucker punch, but still, you know, good for him. <laughs> so, what was the gift? Uh, 
Um, what was the gift? I don't know. Okay. Well, I didn't he, know either. Yeah. He was, cause it, it's, that was, is it after, after the fight mm-hmm. when he says, um, when it's she's the paragraph after the fight. Yeah. And she says, a girl says something to him. No, before that. No, uh, it's, it's, that was her gift, but it's also right. a mention of, um, Shevet had given him what he had what he had to give, and he had accepted the gift. That for a long time he never weighed it or considered its nature. Like, hmm. yeah. Suddenly, Steve, I'm like, I have no idea. I got nothing. I don't know what Le Guin's trying to say there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess maybe like he, Shevet had given him what he had to give. Like that that was the only interaction that they ever needed to have. Like the the their their interaction and their fight, like that was it. Like Shevik had said his piece, so to speak. Because it says they never spoke again, you know. Like they would, and the, like they would see each other. That's the, the next line after that. They they would see each other, but there was never any animosity between them. Like whatever whatever their issue was had been settled, you know. So the gift was that. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe we're, maybe we're, we're, we're spending too much, putting too much emphasis on, on, on gift. I think it's more like an incidental usage. Like Shevik had given, or Shevet had given what he had to give. Which and is what? Shevik had accepted the gift. So, you know. Violence. Yeah. So in what way is violence a gift? No, I don't think it's incidental usage because later on it talks about uh, Bashan. Bashan that way yeah yeah she uses that same phrase and so i think it's deliberate it's not incidental okay hmm. but i just don't get it well it's a gift and it's it's in both instances like the other person is is giving him something okay. so yeah you're right it's not incidental but but that he is he is receiving so, things so from other people and accepting them it is it is an ex it is something that he had not experienced before. Yeah, maybe that could so work. The gift yeah. is the gift is is new experience. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, because her gift was she gave him the freedom of the flesh, which is a much nicer gift to receive than getting punched. I mean, I can speak from experience on that. Um. I've never been punched. Well, good for you. Who would ever want to punch you? What kind of a sick, perverse human being would ever want to punch you? Maybe I just haven't tried hard enough to piss people off. You haven't tried hard enough to get punched? <laughs> Boy, I really thought they were going to punch me. I was really going for it, but no, no punch. Yeah, the, the, the gift of that, of that, you know, that then, you know, it's so good. The, the reduction of animosity. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then and the, it's also in this. Well, we we mentioned that uh, we we mentioned uh, Bashan, um, and from this point for the rest of the chapter, uh, sex is kind of a recurring thing and we get our indication that that the the attitude of the anoresti towards sex is is fairly liberal um they there are couples i think his parents are referred to as partners Mm -hmm. but we also see that uh there was a a scene earlier where his father is referred to uh as as copulating with someone else and that's not really treated as that big of a deal um so like there are established partnerships but having sex with people other than your regular partner is 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 sort of normal um yeah. and also apparently homosexuality is not that big of a deal 
because one but of the also one of the uh, yeah. turns him down because she says she's partnered. That's true. So, so I so I get like I guess like with everything else in the society, it's it's a matter of choice. Like if if you mm-hmm. and your partner have an understanding that you're going to be exclusive, then that's fine. But if but it's also it's it just seems like it's not that big of a deal if you're not. Yeah. You know. Or yeah. you know that as as long as there there is that understanding because. Shevik doesn't respond to I'm partnered, he's back home. Like he recognizes that as a rejection. Uh-huh. Like he doesn't say, okay, well, he's back home, so what? You know what I mean? Right, right. He 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 understands what she's meaning to communicate there. Like yeah. this ain't gonna happen. Yeah. Which is So, you know, that, that makes me question how common it is because like clearly it's not a big deal, but it's also relatively common for, you know, it's common enough that he doesn't, he doesn't, he isn't confused by that. Right. So, you know, so I think maybe equally or, or close to equally common for partners to be monogamous or not just, you know. Yeah. 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 And like I was saying, also, it, it seems like homosexuality is tolerated mm-hmm. because because one of his I think it's one of his friends is mentioned as having like a, a, a relationship with another guy. And it's just sort of a thing. It's not something that's scandalous or or looked down upon. It's just sort of, oh, you know, OK, it happens. That's just Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's just that's just what he's into. No problem. You know, Um And then there's a line near the end of that scene where uh, it's it's uh, Shevik says, um, "I think men have to learn to be anarchists. Women don't have to learn." Like it just he he thinks it comes more naturally to women, and. Um, and I think he's, he, and that, that comes right after his, he's thinking about his relationship with Bashan. And he says, he, he describes her as being, as being more free than he is because he, he talks about his feelings toward her and how, like, even though they're raised in this society where you're not supposed to want to have things, he has this natural desire to be possessed by her and to possess her in the sense of, of the two of them, like belonging to each other as, 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 you know, like being a couple. Um, but he doesn't think that. And yet earlier it said that, you know, she, she'd raged and wept when, uh, he got posted somewhere else. Yes. And he's not the one who had thrown the fit. Right. And then that, that conversation and the, the, the person he's talking to, uh, Vokep tells mm-hmm. him, don't ever let yourself be owned. And Shevik says, I won't. Um, which is interesting because it comes right after he's, you know, he's, he's, he's thinking about, and he, I mean, he says when he's thinking about Bashan, like he's saying like, you know, I was wrong. You know, I thought that I owned her and I thought that she owned me, but I was wrong. I was just young and I didn't know, or, you know. I um, was just young, he says at 18. Yeah, yeah I was, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, but at the same time, like, it it feels like, it, it you know, a not unpleasant thing. It feels like he's kind of talking himself into thinking like, you know, oh, I thought I owned her and she owned me, but I was wrong. Um, but the experience was not a negative one, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's a different sense of ownership, you know, it's not, and it's, it, and it's, it's, it's the kind of, it's the kind of ownership that doesn't really contravene like their, 
their principles of, of, of free association because you're not technically, you're not owning someone in terms of property or in terms of law. It's an acceptance of the other person. Yeah. Like, you know, you know uh, Jalen, Jalen, is that an M or an RN? I can't tell. J yeah, it's an RN. Okay. Jalen and, and suddenly Steve are saying in the chat, the freedom to accept and the freedom to reject. Yeah. 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 It's all in there. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I need to zoom in. I'm getting old. Just the, <laughs> just the prescription. <laughs> Hold up a magnifying glass to your screen. I need the cheaters. You should just do what I do and magnify it. Just increase the you know increase the magnification That's in the chat window. It. Um, I think there's some foreshadowing in the next bit. He would, I underlined, he would always be one. Plus, I just like the line. He would always be one for whom the return was as important as the voyage out. Yes. It's a good line. Yes. And uh, there's, there's, I think it's, is it in that same section? It's one of my favorite lines in the chapter. I think it's in that last section. Um. It's the line, uh, you, you can go home again so long as you understand that home is a place you've never been. I wondered if that was the line you were talking about because I yeah. underlined that one yeah. too. Yeah, I yeah. really I like that line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because again, like it's, it speaks to his, to the contradictory things that he grapples with because at first it doesn't seem to make sense. It seems contradictory, but then he, what he, he's getting at... You're, getting at the the nature of home you know like you think of home as a certain place but you know you can't go back you can't actually yeah that the whole home is not necessarily you can go back to the place yeah but yeah home is not a physical location home is home is 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 a place and time and you can go back to it in one sense, but you can't ever really go back. Like in, when you go back home, you're not going to the same place you were, you know, you're going to the place as it is now, you're going to a new place. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's like the, uh, I forget who said it. There was someone who, who, who said that the past is, um, the past is a foreign country, you know, um, it's a similar idea. Like we think of it in familiar terms, but it's actually more exotic and alien than we realize, you know? Even though we've been there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jalorn says uh, I read that more like home is an emotion. Yeah, I, 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 that's I think that's a valid interpretation too. That home is home is where the heart is, sort of. You know, home yeah. is, is yeah. Home like is I was saying earlier, like it. Rests. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Suddenly, Steve. The past is a foreign country is Hartley. Okay, I knew that. I I knew that I had heard that. I've, and I think I've quoted it before, and I've never quite properly attributed it so <laughs> thank you so then he goes back to the institute right and they have a party um, before that, I marked uh, one of the things I liked, the pleasure uh, when, when he realizes um, he figures out uh, the problem with his equation. Um, and it describes it as the pleasure of patching the hole in his thinking made him oh. radiant. And I marked that, you know, it's, it's enlightenment, yeah. literal enlightenment there. Yeah. I liked that. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. The word choices is, is really good. 
Well, and again, it's it's a really good line. It's one of those lines that you were mentioning earlier, mm-hmm. like that, that are sprinkled throughout. Like that that whole sentence is beautifully written. He smiled. The pleasure of patching the hole in his thinking made him radiant. It's just a beautifully written line. This is we talked about this earlier. That um, yeah, it was it was it was this not last time, but that. The singular forms of the possessive pronoun in Pravic were used mostly for emphasis. Right. But Pravic, I think it mentions that it's a constructed language. So they still exist, despite the fact that this language is constructed to not use them. Which is interesting. Right. Well, I guess it implies that the language was the language was constructed like to serve the philosophy of their society. You know. Like Which to, means they need to they need to have the choice to not use the pronouns in that way. Right. Well, and, and having a language where they don't have those pronouns. Like re, you know, it reinforces the, you know, the whole you don't own stuff, you know. But they have the pronouns. Oh, that's right. They yeah, they they have them. They just choose not to use them. That's what it is. And that's yeah. that's why I asked um, when I was reading this if you had read Anthem, because right. part of the concept for that is that they don't they don't have any personal pronouns or, or singular pro, uh, pronouns. They always speak of themselves in the plural. It's never I, it's always we. Yeah. And it just does not exist. Whereas here, they exist, and so it has to be a choice not to use them. Um, And here, again, a callback to the previous chapter uh, in the next section at the party, the beggar man. Yes. The, the 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 fact that it's a character and and it you know lets us know who he was talking about there when he says I am the beggar man. Yeah, exactly. And and the the they're you know, why don't you give me any money? Haven't you got any money? <laughs> money <laughs> give money, me money. some money. <laughs> uh, a note. Uh, they continue. Oh my God, they're still doing it. And I, I note on, on my next page, she captures youthful philosophizing so well. Yes. <laughs> Cause they do go on. They, they go on with this riff about, you know, the beggar man and you filthy proprietarians, et cetera, et cetera. Like it goes on for a bit. Um, and even the, uh, saying, saying bay instead of buy. Like yeah. that, that, that happens two or three times or they, he, they get, you know, it, it, it's corrected. You're like, it, you're saying it wrong. It's by not bay. And eventually he's like, who cares? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> and this was what you were talking about um, earlier. And you referenced when, when, when he shared his memory about the, the, the burn victim. Yes. Yes. Right here at the end here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, about how he watched, yeah, he watched a burn victim die and he realized that there was nothing anybody could do to help him. They were all just sort of standing there being there, Mm -hmm. but there was nothing they could do. And in fact, the guy was in so much pain that they weren't even sure he was even aware that they were there. Um, and that's when Shevik realizes that. But at the same time, again, he's egoizing here. Because he said it didn't do him any good. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know. That's true. And, and I mean, you don't know how it, if, if you hadn't been there, if he'd been alone, you can't know how it would have been. All you know is how it was. Also, you don't know how it was for somebody else. You, right. You, you know can, how it was for yes, you. Yes. But you can't really know. Yeah. Well, and I also think it's interesting and significant and it ties into their 
<laughs> their prison experiment as children because uh, when uh, when Shevik is challenged for like what what's your point in telling the story and and one of his friends says you're you're denying you're denying brotherhood you know you're saying that that it's uh, life is just suffering and despair and there's nothing we can do about it and Shevik responds by saying I think that brotherhood begins in shared pain you know he's saying that he doesn't know he doesn't have the answer he doesn't understand what we're supposed to do after we gain that insight but he thinks that the beginning of 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 brotherhood of mutual aid of mutuality mutualism in general is shared pain which reminds me of the way they all sort of came together for cad after he was released from the prison after they realized that he had suffered as a result of what they did and they took care of him and they didn't make fun of him and it wasn't you know they they they, they reacted to his suffering with empathy but um, yeah but you could just as easily argue that they worked together to create the prison and that was mutual aid that's true well but they i get but they didn't realize that it would that it would go in that direction like they no, didn't no, they the didn't point is that they were that, that was mutual aid born of curiosity true that's, that's true so shevik is wrong or or at least or or at least it's more complicated story. than he's saying, which it's seems more to be complicated than he understands at this point, which, which is a recurring uh, theme for him. One of the, exactly. It's one of the <laughs> themes. It's, it's, you, it, it's more complicated than that. You just don't, there's so much that you don't understand, but it yeah. seems to be a recurring theme. Yeah. But yeah. And it's suddenly Steve, I, I, I think, I, I, I think he's limiting it. I think that, that brotherhood, no, I don't think curiosity is a kind of pain. Brotherhood begins in shared experience. And it doesn't necessarily have to be pain. I think shared experience is part of it, though. The, the, the... Uh, yeah, I think that would be... that. Yeah. But I disagree that it has to be pain. But it's understandable why Shevik might think that, given what we've seen of him, given what his point of view seems to be. Well, and given the fact that he's 18. Yeah, 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 that too. Absolutely, that too. Um, so, so yeah, so that that's that's the end of the chapter. Um, Ta-da! I like, there's a couple things about it, like just, just sort of general thoughts that, that I enjoyed about it. First, I, I like the storytelling technique of, of moving backwards, of sort of jumping back mm -hmm. and showing us about, Shevik after we've gotten him to the point of, you know, at the end of chapter one, when he has arrived on the other planet and he's at sort of the, the precipice of the story really beginning. And then instead of just continuing with that, Le Guin says, nope, not yet. And Backstory backs us up. Him. Yeah. And, and so, it, and it tells us more about our main character, which is, which is important. And also it builds anticipation for what is happening next, you know, instead of just diving right back in and saying, okay, and here's what happened the next day. It's okay. We're going to get to that. I know you're interested in that, but first here's some other stuff. It sort of makes you wait. Um, I like that. I also like the fact that, um, Anarish does not strike me as an ideal society. And if, if Le Guin's aim or one of one of Le Guin's aims in the book is to to present a story that that argues in some way for anarchism she's not doing it in a way that is painting it as like is, is only painting it as a rosy picture yeah you know she's it acknowledging the complications the and the challenges yeah it seems respectful of the reader yeah and it seems not it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem as, it doesn't seem didactic. Um, yeah. and I have, as I've said many times when talking about Star Trek, I have no problem with things being didactic as long as I agree with them, <laughs> but, but it's, as someone who is not necessarily sympathetic to, to anarchism, or at least isn't convinced of the practicality of anarchism. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that, that, while the story does at least and we're only two chapters in so i don't you know but but as far as what what i've read so far um 
it is presenting it in a way that I can understand what the advantages of it would be for the for the characters, for the people living on Anarish. But at the same time, it doesn't it's not painting it as like, oh, wouldn't you love to live here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem like hell on earth or anything. It doesn't seem awful, but it doesn't seem like someplace I would want to live. You know, it seems like like, no, I don't I don't think I would actually. Um, really? No, 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 not at all. Um, not at all. But 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 part of that isn't part of that isn't due necessarily to the way the society is organized. Part of it is just it just seems like kind of a crappy planet. I mean, it just yeah. you know that's not necessarily not it's not all their fault. Yeah, suddenly Steve in the chat it is it says it is called an ambiguous utopia. After all, that's true. You that know, is that is the subtitle. True freedom in exchange for hard work and challenge. I'm, I'd be up totally up for that. Yeah. Maybe in a different environment. That one. That's, just the, uh, that's I, I don't know. I think, like Shevik points out earlier, that that's you know part of part of the allure for me is the is the challenge. You know, can you make it work, even in a tough situation? Yeah. Uh, Daryl Sartreki, I, I think you know that's that's what we're exploring here, and I I disagree strongly with you. So any other final thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, what, what are you, what are, do you have any final thoughts on chapter two? No, I kind of, I kind of, you know, just went through everything as I went along. Yeah. Um, I would be interested to see if your perspective on, uh, on, on living on an ours changes. Cause like, <laughs> like I said, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't think it's ideal. I think, I think it is, you know, like the subtitle says ambiguous. Um, but you know, Hundred percent, I'd go for it. Yeah, I I mean I appreciate it, it. It reminds me of of things that you've said when we've discussed anarchism, um, which is that it only it only works so far as the people in the system want it to work, you know, and the 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 inconsistencies that that we see in chapter two are all as far, as far as I can tell are, are all the result of, you know, human hypocrisy or, mm -hmm. you know, lack of perspective. It, it or, I like the story makes room for that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think that's realistic. Um, you know, like, like, like you were talking at, back at the beginning, the, the teacher chiding Shevik for being egoistic when, what the teacher is doing at that moment is also egoistic and 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 to mm -hmm. a certain extent those are kind those are inconsistencies that to a degree you can't really avoid um, because of our human nature because of our human nature exactly the same way with shevik and and bashan feeling as though they want to possess each other in a society that frowns on that kind of possession um or frowns on possession just in general um you know those are those are the challenges that even a society like this, which where we get the impression that it's a couple of it's several generations in now, like this is this is established like these, you know, these these kids have never known a world any different than this. This is just the way it is um, that even in that environment, they still have these struggles and still have to sort of ask themselves these questions and try to reconcile these things. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I think that's, that's a much more, <laughs> a much more honest depiction of what a society like that would be, um, you know, and why someone like me who is more skeptical of it would, would tend to think that it wouldn't actually work out in reality. Um, but, you know, we'll see, but I'm very, I mean, I'm really enjoying it so far. It's super well-written. Uh, some of the language is absolutely gorgeous and I'm really, really intrigued as, you know, to where it's going from here so yeah <laughs> all right well 
sounds like we're pretty excited about chapter three. Yay! And we, yeah, okay. And we're, so we're going to be back in two weeks for chapter yep. three. Yeah, um, plenty of time to read. Plenty of time to read chapter three. So everybody who's into this, make sure you have chapter three read by two weeks from tonight. Um, there'll be a quiz. There will, yes, Dana I'm is. totally kidding. Dana is a teacher. There quizzes. will be a quiz. Get that. No. <laughs> you grade them. You grade them. You, get, you make the quiz, you grade it. Then there can be a quiz. And <laughs> oh, Charles Chapman chapter is saying, remember to charity links. Promote the, yeah. Yes, charity, charity links. yes, charity links are in the description of the video. These these are um, some friends of ours who need a little bit of a helping hand. There's a Google Doc there if you click that link, uh, or I guess copy paste it into the uh, address tab of the browser. Um, that our friend Sabrina Geek. Congratulations to Alter Trekkie. Oh wow, yeah, congratulations, Alter Trekkie. Um, prolific little writer you are. Um, but yeah, and also uh, on. On Monday, I will be back with my next uh, conversation stream. My guest will be Dan Errol, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about his. He's he has a new book coming out soon-ish about Sweet. about uh, the the um, the embracing of far right figures by uh, the new atheist movement, which will be interesting. And I'm sure. And Dan Dan is also an anarchist and and a communist, and and I'm sure he will have some thoughts on the election and uh, on sort of the, the state of politics in the United States at the moment. That'll be really interesting and fun to talk about. Dan's one of my favorite people in the world. Um, you should ask him if he's read the Dispossessed. I I should I should ask him if he want, if he wants to to join us next time. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so that'll that'll be Monday, and then Wednesday we'll be back with uh, Trek Reluctantly for the Woo-hoo! second half of the premiere of uh, Firefly. We'll finish that off, um, and then a week from tonight will be my Ask Away Q and A stream. So there you go. That's what's coming up. Um, at least live. At least live. Yeah, and then yeah, and Wednesday is also uh, actually yeah because we're I'm, I'm writing it now. When next Wednesday, as far as the recorded videos is is the next. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, awesome. Where I talk politics. Steve talks politics. Imagine that. Who would have thought? Who would have Who would have ever imagined that I would be talking politics in a video? Um, All these guys apparently. Apparently, I'm sure they are. They are very familiar with it. Yes, yes. And as Duralta Trekkie says, live long and prosper. Both Hi, hands. Hi, everybody. Both <laughs> Thanks for watching, more everybody. More fingers. <laughs> See you later, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming.